Good morning. If you're watching us on the internet, welcome to Open Door Bible Church in West Dawson, New Hampshire. Glad to have you join us this morning. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2. Now, as I go along and as I teach the Bible, one of the things I realize is that we as adults, when we went to school, paid no attention to geography and even less attention to history. So, geography about this chapter. This is the first letter in the Bible written to someplace else other than the Middle East. Every other letter so far has been addressed to a church and what you and I would know as the Middle East. This is the first letter to be addressed to a church in Europe. So, gospel is spreading. Paul is helping spread the gospel. And that he is now going to write to European Christians. But you didn't know that was not the special about this book. Right. We're going to start off like Paul starts his letters off with a greeting. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's a typical Apostle Paul greeting, grace and peace. The Apostle Paul did not like to work alone. He understood that the work of God goes better with a team. He had a team gathered around him. Uh, so he liked working with a team. He liked working with others. Uh, he addresses this from himself, from Silvanus. <coughs> Silvanus is another way of saying Silas. Silas was a long and experienced companion of Paul. He traveled with Paul on what we call Paul's second missionary journey and was imprisoned and set free with Paul in the Philippian jail. That story is back in Acts chapter 16. When Paul first came to Thessalonica, Silas came with him as well. That's in Acts 17. So the folks in Thessalonica would have recognized his name. It was somebody they knew. He also mentions Timothy. Uh, Timothy is a guy I would have described to you as the Apostle Paul's protege. He was the guy Paul was training. Uh, he was a resident of Lystra, a city in the province of Galatia. He was the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother named Eunice. From his youth, he learned the scriptures from his mother and his grandmother. We find that in 2 Timothy. Timothy was a trusted companion and associate with Paul and accompanied Paul on many of his missionary journeys. Paul would send Timothy to the Thessalonians on occasions. All right now it talks about the church of the Thessalonians. Paul found this church in the city of Thess Thessalonia on his second missionary journey. Now he was only in the city for a short time before he was forced out by the enemies of the gospel. Yet the church of the Thessalonians continued alive and active. Though Paul had to suddenly leave this young church, his deep concern for them prompted this letter. The letter presupposes as a basic truth that Paul thought it important, even essential, to organize these young converts into a community of mutual interest, care, and fellowship. Paul knew better than to leave this young church with nothing more than a vague memory of his teaching. The local organization was as yet primitive, but was sufficient to maintain itself and carry on the business of the church. Paul left, but he's still going to communicate with them in writing. Again, now he does his typical greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to notice that the first words of 1 Thessalonians form the usual beginning of a letter. That's how letters were done in those days. So, Paul's being true to character, he's being true to how things were done in those times. Verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all. See, he was a southerner. Did you get it? You all? Oh, come on, I'm working out. Thank you. We give thanks to God always for y'all, making mention of you in our prayers. So when Paul thought of the Christians in Thessalonica, 
his heart was filled with gratitude. Paul, Paul started the church there in less than ideal circumstances. He was run out of town when the church was not even a month old. So he probably had three Saturday services with this church before he could run out of town. Those three Saturdays were enough for him to teach them the gospel and for them to accept Jesus. But he understands that we've got to keep on going here. So he prays for them. He prays for them often. He prayed for them with real feelings. We all probably ought to be praying for more people and more things than we are. Uh, all the time. All the time. Uh, now, when I pray for you all, you all, I pray for you based on the way you sit. Don't change your seat. You're going to goof me up terribly. Because literally, I can lay in bed at night and I can see wherever one of you sits. And I start at the back of the room and I pray my way up this side, then I start over here and pray my way back. If you change your seat, you goof up my prayer line. So don't do that. All right. Verses 3 and 4. Talks about why Paul gave thanks. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in light of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Now, he tells them all this good stuff they're doing that he remembers and they learned that in less than a month from the Apostle Paul. So, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. There were things about the Christians in Thessalonica Paul could not forget. He remembered them. When he remembered them, they made him thankful. He talks about their labor of love, their patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, despite problems, and there were problems, and he will address the problems, there was an undeniable work of the Holy Spirit and a marvelous change in their lives. The three great Christian virtues were evident among them. Faith, love, and hope. And remember, this is a church Paul spent less than a month with. And he's got them fairly well grounded for that. Their faith produced work, as is the nature of all true faith. Their love produced labor. The Greek word Paul used implies toil, which is strenuous and sweat-producing. Their hope produced patience, which is the long-suffering endurance needed not only to survive hard times, but to triumph during them. Verse 4. Knowing, beloved, your election by God. Paul reminded them that God loved them, and that God had chosen them. Now the verses we'll look at next will talk about why Paul was so confident in their election. What he saw that convinced them their faith was real. Because he's going to describe in verse 5 that there were changes. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So he says, our gospel did not come to you in word only. Gospel is not a matter of mere words. In modern culture, there is an overflow of information or entertainment that often only amounts to mere words. Yet the gospel is more than words. The gospel has power. The message of Jesus Christ has power, it has power for miracles, power for wonderful signs from God, and best of all, it has the power to change minds, hearts, and lives. It had power in Paul's day, and it still has power today. Can somebody say amen? amen. Okay. You, you can say that once in a while. It's okay. It won't scare me. And he goes on and talks about, and in the Holy Spirit, it is the message by the Holy Spirit a living person and a member of the Trinity who works within the hearts of the hearers to convict, to comfort, and to instruct. If the preacher only speaks, then it's a matter of words only. 
But when the Holy Spirit works through the words, a great spiritual work is accomplished. That's what we pray for every week, that the Holy Spirit will take and touch the words as, as I'm giving them to you, as I teach you the Bible, that you know what's real. And he goes on and describes it as happening as, and in much assurance. It is a message given in much assurance. This describes a preacher who really believes what he preaches. There is no substitute for assurance. And if a preacher doesn't have it, he should stay out of the pulpit. That's where the commentary stops. If you can see my page up here, the stuff I ad lib is in red. So this is my ad lib. He should stay out of the pulpit and off of late night TV. You know what I think of late night TV preachers. All right, verse 6. The Thessalonians responded to the gospel by becoming followers. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So the Thessalonians stopped following other things, think idols, and followed after Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that it was a good thing for them to follow him. And Paul was not shy about saying, follow me. He wasn't trying to get attention on himself. What he wanted to do was use himself as an example of how to live the Christian life. It says that they received this word in much affliction. The Thessalonican Christians distinguished themselves because they received the word even in much affliction. The message they heard came with adversity. There were folks there who opposed the message. Yet they received it, and Paul thanked God because of it. He goes on and says, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. When the Thessalonican Christians faced affliction because of the word, they didn't just face it with a resigned fatalism. They faced it with the joy of the Holy Spirit. They saw all the things that were happening to them as opportunities to show their faith in God. Not long before coming to Thessalonica, Paul and Silas personally experienced the principle of having the joy of the Holy Spirit even in the presence of afflictions. They sang songs in the Philippian jail despite their chains and their sufferings. They beatings. They were examples of the same spirit to the Thessalonian Christians. So they didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk. All right, verse 7, Thessalonians responded to the gospel by becoming examples. So Paul says, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. So since they became examples, first Paul was an example to them, then they became an example to others. That's how it's supposed to work. I teach you, you teach others. Since it happened to all in Macedonia and Achaia. These Christians needed examples. And these folks in the church of Thessalonica supplied this needed example. This was true even when they had been followers of Jesus for just a short period of time. As Christians, we always need others who will show us how to follow Jesus. It needs to go beyond hearing and it needs to be a living Example. Verses 8 through 10 talk about how they responded by sending forth the word of the Lord. And from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. But they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. All right, so verse 8. From the word of the Lord, from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. This was part of this example to show that they were really saved. They just didn't know the truth. They were sharing the truth with others. 
They were keeping it to themselves. They were sharing it. It says your faith to God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Paul didn't have to tell these other people. The Thessalonians would tell them. They said, hey, here's what God's done for us. God wants to do that for you. They were becoming little evangelists. They were becoming little missionaries. Paul was reproducing himself. You know, we, we learn the Word of God. We study the Word of God so that we know what God wants us to do. We don't do it so we can get a fat head and say, you wouldn't believe how much Bible I know. We do it so that we stand behind somebody in the supermarket. Instead of talking about the weather or the Red Sox, we can talk about God. That's what we're doing. We're getting ammunition to use. That's how it's supposed to work. Verse 9. How you turn to God from idols. This is a perfect example of the results of conversion. This is why Paul could be so confident these guys were really saved. Because they were out doing the job. They had turned to God from idols. They put all that stuff away. Now the verb Paul uses here, this word turned, is from a Greek word, which is used to indicate that a person has been converted and is turned around and now going in, the fall in a different direction. So I tell you all the time, Repentance is, I'm going this way. God gets a hold of me. God turns me around, and I'm now going in the other way. That's repentance. That's what Paul is saying these guys demonstrated with their life. They repented. They were going in a different direction. They weren't going towards idol worship. They were going towards the true and living God. And then to show you that they got it, not only did they get saved, <coughs> But they got the right theology, and they knew what was coming. Verse 10, And to wait for his son from heaven. They understood Jesus was coming back, and they were looking for it, and they were living like they were ready for it. It made a difference in their lives. Now, I can stand up here and tell you Jesus is coming back, and you can get excited, or you can say, yep, they've been saying that in church for 2,000 years now. But you know what? Every day it's closer. You read the headlines, it's closer. Jesus is coming back, folks. Uh, I believe in my lifetime. Now, there's guys who've gone before me who believe in their lifetime. But we're supposed to always be looking for the imminent return. I mean, how much worse is the world going to get before Jesus comes back? No man knows but the Father. No, nope, but he's coming, and man, I believe it's so. All right. Takes us into chapter 2. <clears throat> chapter 2, Paul's going to talk about his ministry. He's going to talk about his credentials. Why? Because there were people there who were attacking Paul's message. They weren't listening to him. They were fighting him. So verses 1 and 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before, and was spitefully treated at Philippi. As you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much comfort. So he says, for you yourselves know. This begins a section where Paul's going to defend his own character and ministry to the folks of the Thessalonian church. This wasn't because Paul was insecure about his ministry, but because he had many enemies who discredited him, especially while he was away. Uh, Paul's enemies would tell folks he left town quickly because he was a self-serving coward. No, he left town to save his life. And Paul's emphatic calling to the Thessalonians to witness showed his confidence in them. He had no fear that they would succumb to the propaganda being put before him. He goes on, he says to him, our coming to you was not in vain. No, it, it was for a purpose. It was for a reason. You know, Paul was there to get a job done. He says in verse 2, even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. Now, remember, Paul and Silas are in jail. They've been 
beaten, they were put in stocks, their feet were locked in place, they were in the dark, there's probably rats running around, and there they are singing praises to the Lord. A Philippian jailer hears it, there's a commotion, the prison's open, the chains come off, Jealous is going to kill himself because he thinks they've escaped. And they said, no, we're right here. It's all right. And he brings them out and he washes their wounds. So they've been beaten probably almost to death. Been thrown in this dark place. Blood still pouring down their backs. Rats running around their feet. They're released. They leave Philippi. And the next place they show up is Thessalonica. Now, Paul's sitting there to teach him, and he can't put his back against the chair because his back hasn't healed yet. That's how recent his suffering was. So when Paul tells him, you know, hey, we suffered, he isn't making it up. If they had gotten the typical Roman beating, which is 39 lashes, they were in a deep, deep state of hurt and trauma. But here they are, still telling the truth, still going forward. All right. It says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel in much conflict. Paul was not concerned that he might get beaten again. He was going to give him the message, no matter what. That's how Paul was. He had a job to do. He's going to do it. Nothing scared him off. All right. In verses 3 through 5, Paul's going to talk about the integrity of his message. So he says to him, for our excitation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who tests our hearts. For neither at any time do we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. He's saying, God is a witness to what I'm telling you. All right, so verse 3. For our excitation did not come from error or uncleanness. The purity of Paul's message made it apparent that there was no deceit, uncleanliness, no misunderstanding. His ministry was completely true. In the first century world Paul lived in, there were many competing religions and many traveling ministers of the gospel, uh, many traveling ministers of these other religions. And they were in it just for money. All they cared about was how much they could get, and then they went on to the next town. Paul's saying, we're not like that. We're not motivated by gain. Verse 4, as we have been approved by God. Paul used a word here that was associated with approving somebody to being fit for public service. Just as public officials and missionaries were tested before they were commissioned, so were the Apostle Paul and his team. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Paul knew his gospel wouldn't always please men, but he knew that it was always pleasing to God. Paul did his best to make the gospel as attractive as possible, but he never changed his message. He never compromised on issues like man's sin, Jesus the Savior, the cross, the resurrection, the need to have a new life. He wouldn't compromise any of those topics. He's going to tell it like it is, whether it upsets anybody or not. Verse 5, For neither at any time do we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, Paul understood that covetousness always has a cloak. It is always concealed by a noble-sounding idea. But Paul did not use flattering words that were a cloak for covetousness. He spoke it like it was. He let the chips fall where they would, and he didn't apologize for it. Right, verses 6 and 7, we're going to talk about Paul's gentle, humble attitude among these people. Nor do we seek glory for men, either from you or from others. But we might, have made, we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, 
just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So in verse 6 he says, Nor do we seek glory from men. When Paul ministered among the Thessalonians, he was unconcerned for his own personal glory. He didn't need fancy introductions. He didn't want lavish praise. His satisfaction came from his relationship with Jesus, not from the praise of people. Now he says, we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul was among the Thessalonians to give them something, not to get something. He did not come making demands as an apostle. Now, as an apostle, he had a right to expect certain things. But he waived that right. He just wanted to help them. Verse 7 says, but we were gentle among you. Paul likens himself to a nursing mother who always looking to give good to her child. Though some among the Thessalonians had accused Paul of ministering out of self-interest, out of greed, Paul simply asked the Christians to remember the gentle character of his ministry among them. Verses 8 and 9, Paul's self-support and hard work among the Thessalonians demonstrated that his motives were pure. So he says in verse 8, So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Now, let me explain all of this to you. We're pleased to apply to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. The sacrifices Paul and his team endured for the sake of the ministry to these people was not a burden to them. They were well pleased to do it because they were affectionately longing to see these people become more like Jesus. He says, but also our own lives. Paul's preaching and that of his team was effective because they gave not only the gospel, but their own lives as well. Now he says in verse 9, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. Now, when he says labor and toil, he's not talking about the work of the church. He's talking about the work they did to support themselves. All right? Paul recognized his right to be supported by those he ministered to. That's covered in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But voluntarily gave up that right to set himself apart from other missionaries of the false religions. Paul denied his personal rights and took a higher standard upon himself. Now when Paul says he worked day and night, again, that wasn't day and night to build the church. That was day and night to support himself. So he began his craft of tent making early in the morning, before dawn. Now, he wanted to get his 8, 10, 12 hours of work in, so there was still daylight left to preach. He's, he's making enough money to support himself. The other two guys are working. They're making enough money to support themselves. They're not asking the church to take an offering. They're not asking the church to support them. They're not asking the church to put them up in an air-conditioned motel. They're paying their own ways to go. By the way, that's why I love our missionaries that we work with. Not one of those guys lives in an air-conditioned house. They live just like the people they minister to. If the people they minister to sleep on a dirt floor, they sleep on a dirt floor. They don't have air-conditioned houses that live different than the people they minister to. They live just like them. So, Paul didn't want his financial support to be a burden to the Thessalonian church, and he didn't want it to become an issue where people could say, you're just in it for the money. Now, I don't talk about this here much, but that's the same reason Pastor Terry and I have chosen not to receive a salary from the church. This church has no paid employees whatsoever. Everything that's done here is a labor of love Amen. by the people who do it. Amen. Uh, God's been good to me. God takes care of me. God takes care of Pastor Terry and his family. Right. Every dime you give 
pays for the lights, pays for the rent, and everything else goes to missions. It all goes overseas to missionaries. It funds things like the yard sale, it funds Christian radio, but there's not a dime that goes to Terry and I. I don't get gas mileage. My wife's listening, my wife's listening. I pay for all the printing we do. I buy the paper myself. We all the, everything you get, we print at home ourselves. Trish doesn't buy the paper, doesn't buy the ink. We just all do what it takes to keep things going here. Uh, that's how it was with the Apostle Paul. That's how Terry and I feel we're supposed to do the church. All right, verses 10 through 12. Paul's own behavior demonstrated the integrity of his character. So he says to these people in verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we have behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So he says in verse 10, you are witnesses and God also. He says, God's watching us. God knows what we're doing. We're accountable to God. God's the boss. God's the one that does my job evaluation. God's the one who sends me to the woodshed when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. God's in charge. And he says, we behave blamelessly. Paul was able to say to these guys, follow me as I follow Jesus. Because there was the power of Jesus in Paul's life. Paul couldn't do what he did in his own. The guy would have crumbled. But God gave him the strength to carry on. Verses 11 and 12. How we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you that you would walk worthy of God. They just poured themselves into these people. Teaching them. Loving them. Correcting them. Taking their phone calls in the middle of the night. Going to hospitals, going to nursing homes, doing whatever they had to do. They just did the ministry. Verse 13, Paul is thankful for the way they welcomed the gospel. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. These guys got it. They got it the right way. It caused a change in their lives. Now, they're surrounded by a culture going in a different direction. They're surrounded by a culture that doesn't understand them. Sounds like how we live, isn't it? People understand you? Nah, they don't understand what makes us tick. You know, they think we're all wackos. Uh, one of my favorite sayings, and this was taught to me by a pastor I had, I may be a nut, but I'm screwed on to the right bolt. That's the definition of a Christian. We're screwed on to the right bolt. So, it says, when you receive the word, Paul earnestly believed and taught others what God had told him. You know, Paul had a message from God, and he's going to take that message and share it with men. In fact, if you looked at how Paul taught, what he said was, I'm going to entrust this message, this nugget of truth from God, to faithful men who will teach other faithful men who will teach other faithful men. And it's been repeating itself for 2,000 plus years. That's how it works. By the way, seminaries were not God's idea. Seminaries were man's idea. God's idea was, I'm going to teach faithful men, they're going to teach other faithful men, we're going to teach other faithful men, and that's how it gets passed down. That's where the real work gets done. So they welcomed it not as the word of man, but as the word of God. And he goes on, he says, it effectively works in you who believes. It makes a difference. It gives you the power and the ability to get through life. It gives you the power and the ability to get through hard days. Right. When everything is going wrong, 
when you finally think you got the car fixed and instead it falls off the jack stand and you punch a hole in the car with the jack stand. God's still there. God's still in control. We can still say praise the Lord. Remember what Job said? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We ought to be able to do that every place we go in everything that happens to us. Verses 14 through 16. These guys welcomed suffering. Well, here's a message title. Welcome suffering. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved, so it was always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. I don't ever want that to happen to me. I don't want it to happen to you. All right, verse 14. For you also suffered the same thing. When these folks in Thessalonica responded <laughs> to the gospel, they became targets of persecution, just like the churches in Judea did. They weren't alone. They were suffering just like every other Christian has suffered throughout history. Now Paul describes this trouble. Who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. So there's the New Testament response to the gospel. There's the Old Testament response to God. They killed Jesus. They killed the prophets. Whoever brought God's message, they killed. They didn't like the message. So what do you do? You kill the messenger. So please don't call me and tell me that somebody doesn't like you. That somebody's offended at you because you're a Christian. What did you think was going to happen? Target on your back. Target on your back. They killed Jesus. You think they're going to be nice to you? Nope. I don't think they're treated any better than Jesus did. And he goes on and says, these guys don't please God. Verse 16, they even, now, I'm going to take you inside the heads of the guys who are persecuting them, because you need to understand what's going on. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved. So, Paul's there. Paul wants to reach out to the Gentiles and see them saved. And boy, these folks are getting all upset. Now, it's not that they didn't want to see people saved. At that time, the Jewish people were big into making proselytes. That was their word for converting a Gentile to a Jew. Now, they weren't real concerned about them getting saved and getting into heaven. They were concerned about them becoming Jews. Now, they really wanted you to become a Jew. That meant that they wanted to take a Gentile guy they wanted to circumcise him so he was just like a Jew. What they wanted to do was make little Jews and they wanted to cut notches on their spiritual combat. Look what I did, God. I made four more proselytes this month. Aren't you lucky to have me? Okay, so that's the upset. Paul is having the audacity to tell the Gentiles they can just get saved. Never mind becoming Jewish. Never mind getting circumcised. Just come and know Jesus. Well, that's not the message these guys have been giving them. They've been saying, Yuppa, got to be Jewish first, and then we do the next step. But the first step, what they were counting, or what was important to them, was making miniature Jews. And Paul says, don't need to be Jewish, you need to be saved. So, this whole opposition was not against getting Gentiles saved, was against getting Gentiles saved without them becoming Jewish first. That was the real problem. All right, verses 17 through 20, Paul's going to explain to him why he's not there. Why is Paul out of town on assignment? But we, brethren, 
have been taken away from you for a short time in presence. We're not physically here, but not in heart. We endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And we are talking about second coming again. For you are our glory and joy. So, it says I'm away from you for a short time. I'm not there physically, but I'm certainly there in heart with you. I still love you. I still care about you. I'm still praying for you. Paul knew that the Thessalonians appreciated the comfort he gave him, but they kept wondering why he wasn't coming back in person. They naturally thought it would be much better to have Paul there in person. Yet Paul assured them that the reason was not his lack of love or lack of desire. There's another problem. It tells him in verse 18, we wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. It wasn't that Paul didn't want to visit the Thessalonians. It was that Satan hindered Paul and his associates. Paul assured them he desired to be with them, but he was hindered by Satan. And that happened time and time again. Now get this. Paul, in all his apostolic ministry and authority, could still be blocked by Satan. He could still be attacked. Now, it doesn't stop there. God gave the victory. Back in Acts chapter 20, we see Paul's ultimate return to the church in Thessalonica. But he had to get through some stuff first. So he says to them, he reasons with them. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Paul assured the Thessalonians that he could never forget them because they were his glory and his joy. His inability to visit should never be taken as a lack of love or concern. And Paul explains to him, for you are our glory and joy. Paul again expressed deep feelings for these people. He described himself in sharp contrast to the persecutors he had mentioned earlier. He declared that they were his glory and joy, not only at Christ's return, but at that very time. So, Paul wants to be with them right now. More than that, Paul wants to stand with them when Jesus comes back. That's what he was looking for. And that is the end of our two chapters. If you've been watching on the internet, thank you so much for joining us at Open Door Bible Church. Come and visit us. West Ossipee, New Hampshire. Same parking lot at McDonald's. Sunday mornings at 9.30, Wednesday Bible studies at 2 and 6.30. God bless you and have a wonderful weekend.